So it's a little intimidating having to follow all the great speakers that have, that have been up here so far, uh, but I'll do my best. Now, you're supposed to, I took the seminars on how to speak in front of people, and they tell you that you, know, you always have to start with humor. Uh, so what I want you to do is think of your favorite joke. <laughs> <laughs> about something that uh, I don't understand very well. We're going to talk to you about consciousness, you know, why we are conscious and conscious of what it is. Uh, first, a little bit of the evidence from uh, neuroscience, you know, how we know what the brain does and that the brain you know, is probably involved in consciousness. And then uh, about philosophy, especially modern um, deniers that the brain causes consciousness. And then I'm going to while I'm talking about that, I'm going to draw analogies to creationism, because the denial of my field, especially of neuroscience, the denial that we are really just those five pounds of meat inside of our skulls, is a form of creationism. Great. So some little philosophical background. Um, you know, before, really, very recently in modern science, we really had no idea of, you know, what the seat of consciousness was. And so the ancient philosophers, really classical and, and medieval philosophers, thought that uh, we were really possessed by spirits, that we were uh, a physical entity in the physical world, but our, con our intellect and our consciousness were not physical, but spiritual. Uh, Plato said that we are a soul imprisoned in a body. Um, there's a ton of philosophical terms that go before the word dualism, and I'm not going to get into substance dualism versus that kind of dualism because it's crazy. So I'm just going to use a couple of basic terms. In Plato's time, what they thought that the actual thinking was was spiritual, that the, all this, this stuff that we now could really see pretty in a pretty reductionist way that the brain does was actually a spiritual thing, not, not physical. So calculation, perception, memory... Uh, that's classical and up through medieval time. And we get to more of the Renaissance time. Rene Descartes, you know, obviously a consciousness philosopher, I think therefore I am. And he, he uh, came up with more of a consciousness dualism. So not the, he said, okay, the thinking, the memory, all that kind of basic stuff, that's your brain. But your consciousness, your subjective experience of existing of yourself, that's what's not physical, that's spiritual. Uh, so that is something, it's a different kind of substance. It's just not matter. It's something else. That kind of dualism, which is the kind of dualism, dualism I'm going to be talking about pretty much for the rest of the talk, is referred to as Cartesian dualism after Rene Descartes. So, just to keep you on the track, we have a guy in a row. We have some Renaissance looking guy. And we get to modern philosophers, and we have Surfer Dude. <laughs> This is David Chalmers, and this is the name that always comes up now. If you talk to somebody who is a Cartesian dualist or any kind of dualist, they go, yeah, but there's David Chalmers' hard problem. You can't get around that. So he, he separated the easy problem from the hard problem of neuroscience, which is the same thing as intellect versus consciousness. The easy problems, not that they're technically easy, but they're conceptually easy in that, yeah, you know, we can see how different parts of the brain are doing different things. Uh, when you're smelling a rose, that's going to the smell part of your brain, and when you're seeing something, that's going to the visual part of your brain, um, and even emotions, and yeah, okay, sure, different parts of the brain do different stuff, and we can break it down, but why do we experience what the brain is doing? What is the subjective component to it? Why aren't we just what he calls zombies, doing everything that we're doing, but just not experiencing it? And he, that, that's what philosophers call qualia. Qualia is that, why is there a quality to something? Why is red red? Why do we experience it that way? What's really interesting is that um, modern Cartesian dualists have started using David Chalmers to defend their position, the hard problem. But Chalmers is not a Cartesian dualist. He completely rejects Cartesian dualism. He, he calls himself a naturalistic dualist, meaning that it's still the brain. We just have no idea what the brain's doing in order to produce consciousness. So it's still a, a naturalistic, it's still a problem of neuroscience. So he advocates that we, we can't reduce consciousness to brain function. 
There's something else happening that's a fundamental law of nature that we have to figure out, and that that's where consciousness is. I don't buy it. I don't think he's right. But he is trying to figure out a naturalistic way to, uh, an explanatory model of, of dualism. But it's real. I love it when the Cartesian dualists go, yeah, but David Chalmers thinks you're an ass. So don't, <laughs> don't rely on him, because he doesn't agree with your position. You know, it's kind of like using Randy to defend ESP. <laughs> All right, look at this guy. Deepak Chopra. So this guy is the Wu Master, right? Uh, he has sort of an Eastern philosophy of dualism. He and others, and he, but I think, has been most prominent in the media. Uh, absolute anti-materialist, Cartesian dualist, right? Materialism cannot explain a lot of stuff including consciousness. He uh, mixes in um, Eastern mysticism with that. And they, uh, some of the Eastern philosophers, dualists, call something substrate consciousness, meaning that there's consciousness in the substrate of the universe, and we are just an expression of that. So there's, we're, our consciousness always existed, and it just manifests in this physical form that goes back to the substrate after we die, but the consciousness always exists, and it's something non-physical or non-material. And um, also, for whatever reason, the Eastern dualists really like to defend their flavor of Wu by invoking quantum mechanics, right? So <laughs> the quantum healing of Deepak Chopra. Because, you know, it's pretty safe for them to do that because nobody understands quantum mechanics. So they can throw out those terms and easily confuse a lot of people because that's what they want to do. They want to confuse people because that way they can substitute their, their belief system uh, for actual for actual science. All right, so I'm a neuroscientist, so I'm gonna talk about the brain for a bit, because I actually like neuroscience. Uh, that's the brain, by the way. <laughs> so brain anatomy, which is really cool, um, there's a lot, a lot of independent lines of evidence that tell us that consciousness is the brain. It's what the brain does. For example, brain anatomy and activity correlate with mental activity. Right? If you're talking, your talking part of your brain is working. Uh, there is no mind without the brain. I'm still waiting right, for some phenomenon that is a mental phenomenon that, the, that is separate from the physical operation of the brain. Now Deepak Chopra says, yeah, there's ESP and reincarnation and clairvoyance, but there isn't anything real. Right? There's just the fake things. So give me something real that is something that we know is happening, but it's not uh, something that we can correlate with the brain. It doesn't, doesn't exist, as far as I'm aware, yet. Brain development correlates with mental development. Immature brains result in immature you know, mental activity. Also, if you damage the brain, this is very important. You damage the brain, you damage the mind, period. You know, I, and in fact, I could damage your mind in a very specific way by damaging a particular part of your brain. I was talking to somebody just yesterday who was asking me about a relative who injured their frontal lobes. And I'm like, they're disinhibited, right? Yep, they're disinhibited. That's exactly what they are. How did you know? Because you injured the frontal lobes, and that's what gives you your inhibition. The brain correlates with the mind. And it's amazing that the personality changes, because the personality is the brain, too. As much as we don't like to really think that way, it's really just the meat talking to itself. <laughs> different states of consciousness correlate with different brain states. Now, I know for a fact that everyone in this room has experienced an altered state of consciousness at some time in their life. You may not remember it, but you absolutely have. It's called dreaming. We do it every night, most of us. Uh, and sleep itself, other stages of sleep. When you're dreaming, you're still you. It's still your brain activity, but it's weird, isn't it? It's not your waking you, it's your dreaming you. Your brain's functioning differently. Different bits of your brain are active when you're dreaming. Then. And some bits which are active, like reality testing, when you're awake, are underactive or not active when you're dreaming. So that's why stuff makes sense to you when you're dreaming, but then it doesn't make sense to you when you wake up and try to remember your dream. Because now, your reality testing module is engaged. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. Why did I think that made sense? Well, because you were in an altered state of consciousness. And guess what? You're, that state correlated with a different brain state. 
So the lines of correlation are triangulating really well. If you turn off the brain, you turn off the mind. Anesthesiologists have a lot of experience with that. Um, you don't turn off the brain and people are still awake. It doesn't happen. The mind does not survive the death of the brain, right, as far as we know. Now, up to this point, you could say, yeah, but this is all correlation, right? <laughs> correlation doesn't prove causation. Oh, that's technically logically true, but it, when it all lines up with only one possible answer, it's still pretty good scientific evidence. But we can do better than that, right? I can you know, specifically turn off a piece of the brain and turn off a mental function. And we can do that now without dam permanently damaging the brain. We used to do it by injecting drugs into half one side of the brain or the other. We still do that, actually. But uh, now we can do it with magnetic, uh, magnetic waves. You can induce a magnetic field which will temporarily turn off a part of your brain. And guess what? That part of your brain no longer functions. Your consciousness changes. We can induce out-of-body experiences at will. Isn't that awesome? It can make you feel like you're floating outside of your body, just like people do when they have near-death experiences or other sort of interpreted as paranormal experiences, or sometimes using certain pharmacological agents you know, may give you that experience, um, which is another way, by, by the way, of changing brain function. So, so far, the science is pretty conclusive that brain states are mental states, the brain is consciousness, and there's no evidence pointing the other way. But despite that, um, there are people who still deny it. Here's just a, projecting a little bit into the future. We're, we're actually engaged in reverse engineering the brain. That's what we're trying to do. Trying to understand how the brain works, but it's kind of like reverse engineering. And in fact, parallel to neuroscientists figuring out what the different bits of the brain do, there are computer scientists who say, oh yeah, okay, let's get a computer to do that and see what happens. And in parallel, what we're doing is reverse engineering the brain and then building computer brains at the same time. We're still a long way from that. Uh, but ultimately, and this will be the ultimate test, right, of the brain causes consciousness hypothesis. When we turn on a, a hard, you know, a hardwired uh, brain, a, a silicon or whatever we're using it 50 years from now, whenever this is going to be, when we turn that on, if it's conscious, well, that pretty much solves the materialism debate. The problem is we'll never really know, right? We, it may act in every testable way like it is consciousness, but we can never be inside its ex subjective experience. Right? As far as I'm concerned, you could all be zombies. And I would have, how would I know, really know? If you're, I say that your you know, um, Chambers, you know, David Chambers, like zombies, uh, but you behave in every way as if you have qualia, as if you have consciousness. Well, that's an unfalsifiable hypothesis, right? So I could never really know. It's also not a useful scientific notion because it's unfalsifiable. All right, so what is consciousness? That's a big question mark, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, part of the problem is, is that there's no really simple answer to what is consciousness. Um, here, I'll give you my best shot, but I, I don't pretend that it's definitive or final. And there may be bits, you know, you know, Chambers may be right, Chalmers may be right, that there may be something going on that we haven't figured out yet. And I would not, that would not surprise me. There may be some, something fundamental going on that maybe is not reductionist, but doesn't really reduce the neurons talking to themselves. That's okay. That's fine as long as you're still talking about the brain functioning. Uh, but what I think consciousness is, is just the moment-to-moment the -moment functioning of the brain. It's the brain taking in information from the outside, you know, introspective, look, talking to itself, um, reflecting on information that it already has, processing information. And there's a subconscious level where lots of stuff is happening, more than you realize. It's amazing how much processing is constantly going on beneath the, beneath the surface of your consciousness. And then some of that is presented to your consciousness, which is that part of the brain which is paying attention. And that's where it gets a little tricky, but that, we're sort of deconstructing that pretty well uh, with fMRI and other stuff. That, yeah, there's parts of your brain that are attending to information, whether it's coming from the outside or coming from the inside. And there's a limited amount of information we can attend to. So we kind of select, and our brain selects for us with subconscious algorithms what we attend to. Uh, so that's consciousness. It's moment to moment. And the thing is, we're trying to assess our consciousness with our consciousness. Right? We can't step outside of it and see what's happening. So that's, I think, why it's so hard to really feel like we understand what it is. Because you still get to the point of, yeah, but what is it that is attending to the information in my brain states? You know, what, what is that? 
Uh, some, some people say that it's an illusion, and that may be an accurate way of describing it, that uh, it's really just a emerge. I think it's an emergent property. That's how I would describe it. It just emerges from the brain's every moment-to-moment -moment functionality. And then some people say that it's just an illusion. I don't know that that's a helpful term. It may be ultimately accurate, but it, I don't think it helps us really understand what's going on. So as you can just see, that's not a terribly concise or satisfying answer. And that opens the door for the paranormalists or, or the, 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 the uh, deniers. In the very same way that you know evolution is a very complex uh, function. It takes millions of years to unravel. There's lots of different mechanisms at work. There's you know, lots of complexity in terms of how it changes over time. Yeah, you can break it down to some rules, but it's just like saying it's an emergent property of the brain functioning. Okay, you could say it's survival of the fittest, but it's the same level, superficial level of understanding. It's really easy to misunderstand evolution, and it's really difficult to imagine millions of years of evolution, and that opens the door for the deniers to invade that inability to really imagine what's going on. All right. This is Daniel Dennett. Probably, most of you guys probably know who that is. He is a philosopher, um, and he uh, doesn't like David Chalmers very much. He thinks that the hard problem is not a problem. Uh, and he agrees with the, uh, it's an emergent property of the brain thing. And he writes very, very persuasively on it. He says, well, you know, if you take Chalmers' easy problem, all the things the brain does, and you take them all away, Chalmers says you're still left with consciousness. Dennett says you're left with nothing, because consciousness is all the easy problems. If you add them all together in real time, that's consciousness. So he, he, he came up with a great analogy. About a, you know, 100, 200 years ago, there were vitalists who thought that there was some vital force to life, right? The life force. There's still people around who believe in the life force, right? We call them chiropractors or acupuncturists <laughs> or homeopaths, but there's, there's no life force. But before you know, we really understood how life worked, it was really complicated. It was, we knew it was different. You know, a person is not a rock, but you really couldn't say exactly why it wasn't a rock. Uh, we didn't really understand all the processes of life. Then people said, okay, well, there must be some life force that inhabits things that are alive. But uh, the biologists, over time, slowly explained all the things that life does, using energy, reproduction, um, etc. So. Uh, there was nothing left for vitalism to explain. Dennis says the same thing is true about the hard problem. Once you, you know, we're, we're inventing this other thing, this dualism, to say this is it's like a god of the gaps argument. It's doing the stuff we can't explain yet, but you know, over time, we're taking things off the list of things we can't explain until there's nothing left for the dualists to explain. There's nothing left for this ghost in the machine to do. I think, was a, I think that was a pretty persuasive analogy. All right. Dualism is really a form of creationism. Uh, the logic is the same. The intellectual strategies are the same. So creationism, I think, is best understood intellectually, logically, as evolution denial. That's the one thing that ties it together, right? Because they don't have anything to explain. They don't have any positive claims. Uh, they don't have any positive evidence. All they have is just ways to deny evolution. And even though there's multiple different types of creationism, all the way from young earth and intelligent design, whatever, at, at their core, they all have evolution in them. Dualism is exactly the same way in that it's neuroscience denial. It's the denial that, that we are chunks of meat, right? Because that's not a very pleasing or aesthetic answer. <clears throat> now this guy, you may not know him. He's not as famous as Deepak Chopra. Is the sound on? Uh, 
And he uh, has managed to commit pretty much every logical fallacy that you can commit and argues just like creationists and, and evolution deniers argue. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the strategies that they use. Confusing does with how is a classic strategy of denial. <laughs> one question you say is, does life evolve? Right, that's one question. A separate question is, how does life evolve? How does it work? We can answer the does, even if we don't understand everything about the how. But creationists will, will use our current um, lack of complete understanding of how to, and, and then argue that it calls into question of whether or not life evolved at all. Right? So ignore and the dualists do the same thing. We can't explain how the brain causes consciousness. <laughs> We can say that there's, there's no consciousness without the brain. It doesn't matter that we don't know exactly how the brain does it. But it's easy to, 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 do, to create confusion with that argument. Correlation is not causation. I alluded to this before. You could say that, well, you can correlate it every way, but that's so just correlation. I think they kind of sound skeptical because they're quoting a logical fallacy, so they must be right, you know, because the other people are using a logical fallacy. It's like, yeah, but you know... We know that smoking causes cancer completely through correlation. There's, no one did the study where you like make people smoke and see if they get cancer. You can't do it. It's unethical. But the tobacco industry used that fact to deny the correlation between smoking and lung cancer, and they're still kind of softly doing it. But they, up until recently, they did it hardcore. There's this factor X that causes both. Well, that's what they're doing. It correlates in every way it should correlate if the brain causes consciousness. That's enough scientifically to say that it probably causes consciousness. So enough correlation does add up to causation. The, the fallacy is in assuming causation from correlation. That's the fallacy. Okay. God of the gaps. There's dualism of the gaps. I'm going to quote people other than Michael Eggman, but he's just so great. He gave me so many juicy, juicy quotes. So, you know, what he's saying is, you know, we have vast knowledge of neuroscience, but we don't understand everything else, every, everything yet. And here he's talking about, you know, there are specific, if, if materialism, right, if our materialist dogma is correct, then every single minute brain, a mental state must correlate with a brain, specifically with a brain state. And what he does is very, is very devious, in that he says that the correlation between conscious states and brain states is imperfect. There's a gap there in our ability to, to minutely describe brain states. That's where dualism comes into play. That's a God of the gaps argument. And what all he's really defining is the limits of our technology. You know, and It reminds me of, of what Dwayne Gish said. I'm going to paraphrase Dwayne Gish, who was a younger creationist who made a, a career out of, of debating um, naive evolutionary scientists who didn't know what they were getting into. And he had a, Gish had a great line. And I, when I heard him say this, I'm like, wow, that's a good propaganda line. He said that the scientists tell us that if we look at the geological record, you can't see evolution ha happening because it's too slow. And if you look at animals that are alive today, you can't see evolution because it's too fast. So no matter where you look for it, you can't see evolution. That's a great line. It's BS. But for propaganda purposes, that's a great line. Eggnor is using the same thing. Well, how come when we do this fMRI study in the EEGs, it doesn't correlate exactly with the, these minute changes in consciousness? You know, because we're, we're using a ground-based based telescope to look at the surface of Mars, and you're asking why we're not seeing pebbles. You know, well, it's just the limit of our instruments. It correlates to the limit of our instruments, but not beyond that. But that's a gap, you know, and as our instruments improve and the gaps shrink, it doesn't matter. There'll always be gaps to fill in your particular version of Wu. Uh, Deepak Chopra is just amazing, this guy. The things he comes out with. Um, hyperactive agency detection is just kind of a funny way to say that you, you perceive uh, intention in stuff that happens, right? Um, we all, you often just say, I, I love this phrase, stuff happens. Or you use another word that begins with S, but you know, stuff happens. Uh, it, sometimes it just happens. But it doesn't mean that somebody specifically wanted it to happen or caused it to happen. That's, but human beings have what's called a hyperactive agency detection. We look for the agent in everything that happens, even things that just happen by themselves. 
And Deepak Chopra does the same thing. He says that if uh, any examples of learning, really, or brain plasticity, is the brain willing itself to change, or it's consciousness willing the brain to change. And therefore, there must be some consciousness outside the brain that can affect the brain. Uh, so he uses this really ridiculous example that if you um, have somebody trying to learn how to walk on a tightrope and they don't intend to learn how to do it, they won't learn how to do it. But if you intend to learn how to walk on the tightrope and you try and you practice, you'll get better. Your brain will change. You'll get better walking on the tightrope. It's just ridiculous. I mean, think about that. Yeah, if you practice, you'll get better at what you're practicing, you know, because the brain is plastic. You don't need this external... A magical consciousness affecting the brain through intention. But that's the Eastern mysticism, right? That's his Eastern mysticism. So that's, he just frames it in that way, and, and people throw millions of dollars at him to read this crap in his book. <laughs> they don't throw millions of dollars at me. I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> um, false controversy. We hear this all the time from the creationists, right? Evolution, a theory of crisis. Scientists are increasingly rejecting evolution. It's on the brink of failure. You know, any day now we're going to realize that the creationists were right all along. That's the propaganda, right? The acceptance of my view is right around the corner. My opponent's views are crumbling and failing. They've been saying this for a hundred years, right? So history, I think, has been on our side. Deepak Chopra says, you know, until the argument is resolved, so as if whether or not the brain causes consciousness is unresolved, not within science. I mean, talk to neuroscientists, they're like, Talk, talk to somebody else. The best course for each of us is to assume that our brains can adapt freely to our vision of life, meaning that if you imagine it, it will happen. This is the secret, right? This is just his version of the secret. If you wish it to be true, if you imagine it's true, then matter will change. Your brain will change. The universe will change to your spiritual, unphysical intention. And I talked about impending acceptance as part of the other thing. So, again, Deepak Chopra, just to, just to reinforce that, that um, the acceptance of the mind field, that substrate consciousness, the ghost in the machine, whatever, as a fundamental level of nature, may be closer than we think. And it will inaugurate an enormous advance in human comprehension of consciousness. So we're, the world is just about to discover that Deepak Chopra is right. And I didn't even, there wasn't the word paradigm in there, but you know, right, when people throw out the word paradigm, that they're full of it, right? That they're making this kind of statement. We're in the midst of a paradigm shift from you being right to me being right. <laughs> All right. D. Alan Wallace. I debated him for a long time on my podcast. So if you want to listen to me, go at it with him directly. Just download the episode. But this guy's a Buddhist, former Buddhist monk, so he's in the Eastern quantum woo end of the spectrum. And he uh, is my example of the other thing that they want to do. And that's they want to change the nature of science. Right? What Wallace says is that we need to reintroduce subjective observation as a legitimate line of evidence in science. Right? Because science is too objective. And we, need some, we need to get subjectivity back. Because then you can just talk to the gurus who go into their trance and discover the truths of reality, and we can just listen to them. And they'll, tell, they'll give us the answers. And we, and, you know, we're we can just take their word for it, you know. So that's, you know, again, science is narrow. So what if, you know, what if the substrate consciousness is correct? Science will never be able to figure it out. We need to listen to these guys. You know, we need to listen to their meditations because that, that needs to be reintroduced into science. And he's written books, more than one, multiple books, basically saying we need to merge Eastern mysticism, which he doesn't like that word, but that's what it is, Eastern mysticism with science. That's his goal. What's the Discovery Institute all about? You know, what's the Wedge document? It's the reintroduction of supernaturalism into science. The science, what if God you know, poofed us into existence? There's no materialist assumptions in the scientific method. We'll never figure that out. We have to allow for supernatural explanations in the scientific method. Of course, they neither of them get it that you know, it's, not a, it's just not a cultural choice that we don't allow subjectivity or... Um, that we don't allow supernaturalism into science. Science, by definition, can't rely upon those things. You can't test a supernatural hypothesis. And we know that, right, because the intelligent designer <coughs> won't even tell us anything about their intelligent designer. Anything you could possibly observe, right, if you take the hypothesis, 
an intelligent designer created life, you know, by magic. Um, okay, well, what would that life look like? Whatever. It'll look like whatever. What does it look like? That's what it would look like. <laughs> and there's, there's no observation you can make that will falsify that hypothesis. So, okay, game's over. There's no science beyond that point. It's not our choice. We're not being the mean bullies kicking them out of the sandbox, right, like Expelled would want you to believe, or Ben Stein. That's not the case. It's just these are the rules. You know, these are the rules, and we can't change them because they don't work if you change the rules. But they want to change the rules. They want to change the rules because under the rules that work, they lose. So it's like the kids out of the playground. <laughs> So just to, to, to conclude, to wrap this up, the purpose is the same. The purpose is not to discover something about the world. It is to, it's not to enhance our understanding of ourselves, of the universe. Uh, it's to provide cover. That's what it's all about. The Discovery Institute exists to provide intellectual cover for evolution deniers, for people who deny evolution for ideological reasons. Dualism, the form of dualism that we're discussing, exists to provide intellectual cover for people who want their religion, whether it's Buddhism or Eastern mysticism or, or Christian fundamentalism, in the case of Egnor, who want their religion to invade the halls of science. So that in order to accomplish that goal, they create this diversion with all these logical fallacies. And that's the purpose. It's not, the purpose is not to advance human knowledge or understanding. It's to turn human understanding back to the Middle Ages, right? To turn it to a pre-scientific era, before we knew what the rules were. Now we know what the rules are, and I'm sorry. But by those rules, these ideas are now obsolete, and they really just have to be accepted and get on with it. I don't think that's going to happen in a lot of cases, but, but that's the way it is. So from, our, from the point of view of skeptics, I think it's really um, important to understand the actual intellectual strategies that people use to deny modern science. It's one thing to say dualism, ah, it's religion, or that's a belief system, and give it the hand. But you know, when you really break it down, you know, deconstruct it, it'll, it, it's very empowering, and you can argue against it much more effectively, like if they throw David Chalmers at you, now you'll know what to say back. But also, you see the connections. You realize that anti-science it's pretty much the same thing over and over and over again. I mean, these guys don't have much of an imagination. You know, they're throwing the same logical fallacies at us over and over, not only over time, but from one topic to the next. So if you really understand all the problems with dualism, you'll actually be able to then apply those same intellectual tools to the vast majority of the kinds of pseudoscience and paranormal stuff that we encounter. Thanks a lot for your time.